E A G L E S. That's what we're here to talk about. John McMullen, Jordan McDonald on Birds 365, and there's no better guy to do it than our next guest. Uh, he has only been chronicling the Philadelphia Eagles for 53 years. Uh, as good as it ever gets at doing so, Ray Dinger, good enough to join us here on Birds 365. You look relaxed, Ray Diddy. Yeah. <laughs> Feeling pretty relaxed, Jody. I am, as a matter of fact. Yeah, it's good to be with you guys. Good uh, on you. Good to see you, uh, Ray. And I love when you have the Emmys up. It's like Emmy Day on Birds 365. <laughs> I, lo- I, I love that. But Ray's, uh, I want to mention Ray's book, One Last Read, The Collected Works of the World's Slowest. Uh, yeah, I got one too. World's okay. Slowest Sports Writer. Uh, it's coming out in paper book. I think it's apropos of Ray because it's Amazon Prime Day. So maybe people can get a deal, go there, wherever you get your books. Uh, but thrilled to have you here. And I, I want to start before I, we get into the Eagles. We're going to get into plenty of the Eagles. But the New York Times yesterday got rid of its uh, um, sports department. And, and I just thought that was apropos. We're going to have Ray, what, Hall of Fame writer. Um, just depressing. When you saw that, and you, the New York Times, Ray, getting rid of their sports desk. Just your thoughts on that. Yeah, sort of gives new meaning to the term sign of the times, because it is. I mean, that's kind of where the newspaper industry is going. And I say that with great sadness, because that's that's where I started, and that's where I spent most of my career. And, you know, in my mind, I've never really stopped being a writer. So when I see that part of the business withering and dying, it it makes me really sad. I, You know, the way it works now, I mean, I've read all the stories and they say that, well, nobody on the actual sports department is going to be let go as such, but they will be reassigned. Um, But the sports, the whole sports coverage will now come from the uh, from the Atlantic, which they had purchased. I'm sorry, the Athletic, athletic, which which they had purchased, not not the Atlantic, the Athletic, (laughs) which they had purchased. And uh, they're going to now provide the sports coverage. But you know, if that can, if they can just liquidate the sports department of the New York Times, you know, where does this stop? Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a, a rough thing, John and Jody, that, uh, you know, a lot of times I get asked to go to colleges and talk to journalism school, journalism students. Uh, you know, and when kids are you know, in college or studying journalism, the obvious question they would ask, as I would have asked in their place, is, you know, okay, what are my job prospects? Where do I go from here? What do you tell them now? You yeah. know, what do you, what do you tell them now? I mean, when I was coming out of Temple in 1968, it was purely a newspaper world. I mean, there was no cable TV. There really was no sports talk radio. I mean, everybody got their information from the newspaper. I mean, you guys are old enough to remember that. Yep. Uh, and now, and now we're living in a world where newspapers have become rather irrelevant. And now we're, we're approaching a time where they're almost going to be non-existent. For, so what do you tell young people? Oh, hey, hey, kids, go out there and get in that industry and make your mark. You know, I, I in good conscience, you just can't do it. It's a yeah. really I'm, I'm just glad that I'm kind of where I am in my career. And I'm not that kid coming out of Temple right now because I don't know where I'd go to look for a job. Yeah. Forget about in, ink stained. All you need to know is dot com. If you want to be a journalist, you want to be a writer, you're going to be doing so on an Internet site. Uh, you're I, right, Jody. That, that's that's where you got to go. That's about the only avenue that's left. Uh, I hate to do this very early in the show, very early in an interview with Ray. I got to throw the challenge flag. Uh, Ray Dinger <laughs> retired from NBC Sports Philadelphia, except he didn't. He was back again last year. <laughs> Ray Dinger retired from WIP. Except he didn't. He jumps on shows and contributes all the time. When I see the title of your book, One Last Read, why do I doubt it, Dinger? Uh, why do I think that that's not happening, that there's going to be another Ray Diddy book to be read? <laughs> um, I'm not making any promises. Uh, there it is. There it is. He's giving himself a backdoor. No, no, not really. Not really. I mean, when I la- it was last a year ago, May, um, when I did announce my retirement and it was with full intention of retiring. Um, I mean, if the Eagles had not gone off on the run that they did, I probably would be retired. And I, I really was for, for really the bulk of last football season, I was out of the fray. I mean, I was going to see my 
granddaughter play field hockey on Saturdays instead of sitting in with Glenn, as I had done for 22 years. I was going out to watch my two grandsons play organized football, and I was really enjoying it. Uh, but, you know, the Eagle season went on that historic trajectory. And come December, both WIP and NBC Sports Philly said, hey, listen, you know, we're, it's obvious these guys are going to the playoffs. Would you come back and work the postseason with us? And, you know, given the way the season was going, how could you say no? Right. Yeah. Well, we did. Uh, but that was and none of this was planned. And none of it to me really represents coming out of retirement. It's just that the Eagles kind of rewrote the script for me. <laughs> yeah, man. I, you know, we've talked about that a lot, Ray, and you're great to talk because you've seen all these Eagles teams, the legendary teams, the Super Bowl 52 team going back to 1960. Uh, you know, you know the history of this organization better than anyone. I'm I'm a Johnny come lately. I've been here since 2016 covering this team. Uh, you know, covered the NFL since the mid 90s. Uh, covered the 98 Vikings. I always said that was the best team I covered uh, until last year. And I covered the Super Bowl 52 team, but I think last year's team was better. Um, they didn't finish the job. Where are you in the when it comes to history that that team last year uh, is sort of in franchise lore, so to speak? If they had if they had won the Super Bowl, you probably would have had to say they were the best team. Uh, you probably would have had to say that. The fact that they didn't, you can't say that now. At least I can't. Um, I, I've I've said all along that I still believe that the greatest Eagles team, and nobody remembers this. Uh, was the 48-49 back-to-back world champion teams, which if you look at their statistics, uh, to me, rank with one of the great franchises ever. Uh, I mean, they're, they're still, they, they, they were the first and they are still the only NFL team to win back-to-back championship games by shutout. Uh, that had never happened before. Uh, it has never happened since. Uh, and they did it. I mean, they shut out the Chicago Cardinals 7-0 to win the first one. And then in 49, they came back and shut out the dynamic Los Angeles Rams offense with two, not one, but two Hall of Fame quarterbacks, Waterfield and Van Brocklin, shut them out 14 nothing to win back-to-back shutout championship games. And we're just dominant in a way that you just don't see teams be dominant with Van Buren and Bednarik and all those guys. So I felt all along that that – I felt all along that was the best team ever. Uh, and I've tried to make that case. But – if the Eagles had actually finished the journey last year and they had beaten the Kansas City Chiefs, looking at everything they had accomplished all during that season, you could have had a pretty good argument. But, you know, when they when they lost and, you know, it's 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 still it's still to me a very tough loss to swallow because I still believe they were the better team. Yeah, it's so funny. So I mean, when they, you know, when they beat the when they beat the, the Patriots in Super Bowl 52, I didn't think they were, but they pulled it off and they won it. Last year, I thought they were the better team. And to lose it in the fashion that they lost it really, really stinks. Still does to this day. Ray, let me ask you this question, and I'm sure you've been asked it before, but maybe not in a while. Um, The Philadelphia Eagles will attempt to go from going to the Super Bowl and losing and going to the Super Bowl and winning. History tells us that's very difficult to do. When you go to the Super Bowl and you lose, your prospects the next year just haven't worked out. If you're purely judging what the results have been for the NFL since they started the Super Bowl, not a good proposition, not trending well going forward. Why is that? Why is it as difficult? The results are what they are. That it's uh, uh, virtually impossible. I want to say impossible, but uh, the numbers are against you. Going from losing a Super Bowl to trying to win one. Why is it so difficult to test? Well, I think you have to start with the numbers, uh, and they're pretty scary when you look at them. I mean, other than the Eagles game, the the previous 56 Super Bowls, 56, that's a pretty good – that's not a small sample. Right. (laughs) 56 of them, uh, only eight of the teams that lost got back to the Super Bowl the next year. Eight out of 56. Just I'm not even talking went back and won it. Right. Just got back. Eight out of 56. Um, so that's not a coincidence and that's not an accident. It's, it's, it's hard. 
it is really hard. Now, part of it are the obvious things that the league that the league creates with the tougher schedule and lower draft picks and all that kind of stuff. Um, that makes and free agency losing players. Obviously, teams that go to the Super Bowl, their coaching staff gets raided. So you have to kind of in, in the modern era of football, if you go to the Super Bowl, you, you are faced with a fair amount of rebuilding the next year. That's part of it. And then the schedule gets tougher and that makes it tougher still. But a big part of it, having interviewed guys that have been in that situation over decades, uh, the, the thing that you hear uh, them say over and over again is just emotionally, it is so tough. It just takes so much out of you to have, have fought your way all the way through a long season, then the playoffs, to get to the Super Bowl, and then to get there and lose. Uh, and then come back the next year and have to start all over again and just start that climb all over again. Guys say it's just just emotionally, it just drains you. Now, some teams can overcome it and some teams come back and they do succeed, but it's very hard. And that's what that's the reality of it. And that's what each of these individual guys has to face. And that's what the whole coaching staff has to face is that that moment of standing at the bottom of the mountain and looking up and saying, Oh boy, here we go again. Uh, yeah. And being able to pull that off over the course of a season and a season in which everybody's painted a bullseye on you. The media attention is greater. The pressure is greater. Your fans expectation is greater. That's a tough rock to push up that hill. Uh, and that's why some really, really good teams haven't been able to do it. I mean, the perfect example, and I remember this was, was the Miami dolphin team with Marino, you know, when Marino got yeah. there, in his second year, yeah. setting all these records, looks like the, the best young quarterback that had come along in a generation. You know, they go out to Palo Alto and they lose to a great 49er team. Certainly no embarrassment there. Uh, and when it's over with, you know, I remember Marino coming into the press conference and saying, well, this is really disappointing, but, you know, we'll be back. You we'll know? be back, yeah. And, and, and who doubted it? I mean, a young Nobody. Young Nobody. Dan, we all thought he'd be there a bunch of times. You know, and, and Shula's yeah. your coach. And, yeah. you know, I mean, everybody said, oh, yeah, they'll they'll, they'll be back. Absolutely. They yeah. never got back. No. Nope. And so, you know, it's, that history will tell you that. So that's the challenge that this Eagles team faces this year. Yeah, you mentioned, Ray, the, the rating of the coaching staff. And we've been through this in Philadelphia recently. If you look at Andy Reid's first coaching staff, it's legendary now. All the names that ultimately became head coaches. And Andy had a phenomenal run here. But as the attrition on the coaching staff continued and continued, it got more difficult. It got more difficult to replace those guys. I remember sitting in the bar in Minneapolis after Super Bowl 52 saying, all right, Doug Peterson's got a lifetime dispensation card. I mean, he just won the Super Bowl for Philadelphia. It turns out that was three years. Um, it, it, you know, losing Frank Wright, John DiPolippo right away, coming off the Super Bowl, that had a big impact. First time with Nick Sirianni losing both coordinators – We've had some interesting feedback on that. Randy Mueller's a friend of the show, former NFL executive of the year, said it's a big deal. We've had some other people say, eh, not that big of a deal. Where are you on that scale of really big issue? It's okay. Everything's fine. Um, you know, I don't I don't know, John. I don't I don't I don't know because I, I don't know that much about the two guys that are coming in. You know, I don't have I don't have a really good sense of, you know, a lot of times you lose one coach, but you hire another coach. that has got a track record or you have some kind of a, you have you've had some experience with him or you've heard talk around the league about people saying, oh, this guy's a, a really good coach. And he's the guy who comes in and you feel pretty confident that, OK, you know, they'll be fine. Um, I really don't know that much about these two guys. I mean, I, I you know, I know Johnson was here last year and. Uh, and the fact is he's worked with Jalen Hurts and has history with him going way back. And on, the, on, a, on its face, you would say, that sounds okay. You know, and the new defensive coordinator, and we have a little bit of an idea of where he came from. He has a history with Vic Fangio and so forth. And, well, okay, but let's see. You know, let us see. Uh, I mean, you're quite right in pointing out, I mean, one of the, th one of the reasons why the Andy Reid team kind of went the way it went uh, 
towards the end really was a big part of it. People really underestimate the attrition of the coaching staff and how much, how big of an impact that had. I mean, you look at how good those guys were and when they left, you know, and, and Andy tried to do the loyal thing and promote from within and yeah. assist, you know, promote his guys and give them that opportunity. Um, you know, but when you got John Harbaugh leaves and you replace him with Rory Segrist, well, <laughs> you know, it's nice of you to give him that opportunity, but, you know, looking at the quality of the two coaches, the special teams went from being the best to being the worst, not a coincidence. So um, we'll see. I mean, I, uh, I mean, everything that we have heard and everything that we've been told suggests that these guys are really good coaches, but with that transition there, there is a transition. And for both of these guys are taking on a big responsibility mm -hmm. that's going to be under a great big microscope. And we'll just have to see how they handle it. But I, I, I will say this. Um, I think Sirianni is a very good coach. Uh, I mean, I didn't know very much about him when he came here. Uh, but I've been very impressed with what he has done. Uh, and I, I have a feeling that he has, um, he has a good handle on things. So, I mean, there's going to be some rough patches this year. And I don't think this season is going to be the, the easy, the smooth ride that everybody kind of thinks it's going to be. But he looks to me to be a guy that's really smart and I think has a pretty good handle on the situation. And whatever comes up, I think he'll be able to handle it. Ray, I'm going to borrow one of my partner's favorite sayings that I like to borrow from time to time because it's dead on point. Nobody worries about stopping the run until they have to stop the run. And then if you didn't do a good enough job, it jumps up and bites in the butt. I'll suggest that it didn't bite the Eagles in the butt till the last game of the season when Isaiah Pacheco ran the ball as effectively as he did against the Eagles. And they only lost three games before that. And I would say none of those three losses were because the Eagles couldn't stop the run. But they were middle of the pack in stopping the run last year, even though they were the second rated overall defense. That's one of my few concerns for this team coming into the season. Is this team going to be able to stop the run? Which means linebackers, edge guys, tackling runners, safeties, major changes in a couple of those positions. Are the Eagles going to be good enough stopping the run this year, Ray? We'll find out. We'll find out. And I, I, uh, I agree with you. Um, I have um, – if, if, if you can't stop the run, you can't win. You know, I don't care. I don't care what era you're playing in. If it, if your defense isn't capable of stopping the other team from running the football, you can't win because they will run the ball. They will control the clock. They will control field position. Um, it's yeah. The idea that ah, that's yeah. You don't have to worry about that anymore. That's nonsense. That's never been true, and it never will be true. Uh, so yeah, they have to do that. And I think one of the reasons why I think people were a little misled about the strength of this team's run defense. Now I look at those numbers out of the middle of the pack. No big deal. No big deal. Well, yeah. I mean, if you're play, if you have an offense that's as dynamic as this team's offense was last year and you're breaking out to big leads every game. Yeah. I mean, you can live that way, but are you going to be able to do that two years in a row? I don't know. Um, I think it's, I, I think a lot of the expectation, look, I don't, I'm not at all concerned about the Eagles offense. I think the Eagles offense is going to be fine. Um, but if you look at the makeup of this team right now, to me, you do have issues on the defense. You do have to replace some key players. Uh, and we're going to be asking a lot out of, uh, you know, the, the Georgia Bulldogs here. You know, they're, oh, yeah. they're, they're yeah. going to be, they're going to, they're going to in many ways tell the tale of this season. I mean, you, if they come in and if Jordan Davis can develop into the player that they drafted him to be uh, and the Kobe Dean can become, anything close to the player he was at Georgia at linebacker. Uh, you know, I, I think that they, I think that they will be, um, you know, Sidney Brown is a, is a, I, I really like him. I, I like him a lot. He was one of my favorite players in this draft. I mean, I saw him play and I thought he was really good. And when the Eagles drafted him, I was elated because I thought he was going to be one of those late later in the draft kinds of guys that gets, sort of overlooked because he's not, oh, he's not the perfect size and he's not the perfect combine guy, but damn, he's a football player. And, and you, when you watched him play in college, you <clears> that. and I, I have a feeling he's going to come in. I think he's going to play right away. And I think he's going to play really well. Uh, and I have the same kind of feeling for Nicobe Dean. I, I mean, I, I saw him play a lot of football at Georgia 
uh, on part of a defense where, I mean, it was a blue chip defense head to head to tail. I mean, everybody on that field seems like he was a first round draft pick, except for Nicobe Dean. <laughs> but in, but but in the big games and in the big moments, the one thing you saw on that team was everybody on that field looked to him. I mean, all of these other guys that were drafted in the first round, um, all these guys that had better pedigrees, when when the rubber met the road and a play had to be made, you saw every guy on that team looked at him. That told me a lot about what kind of player he is. So I, I know there's a lot of questions, and he, he, does he have things to prove? Yeah, he does, to prove it play, play at the NFL level. But I think he will, uh, and I think he's going to come in, and I think he's going to play well right away. I mean, there, they need him to. Frankly, I yeah. mean, he's get, it's not just, oh, we're going to give him a chance to, to win the job. No, the fact of the matter is they need him to step in and be that kind of player. But based on what I saw him do in college, I think he will be. You know, to kind of further that, Ray, uh, I talked about Jordan Davis with Jody a lot, um, sort of an esoteric role in the fact that if you look at those Georgia highlights of N'Kobe Dean and – You've seen plenty of them, a lot of them. The big guy up front is taking up blockers. And, you know, the Eagles will tell you as we get to that run support conversation, um, you know, the whole goal of the big Fangio defense is to have the extra guy. Everything's a math equation in modern professional sports, which is not fun, to be honest. But they want one less guy in the box. So they have one more guy in coverage to limit explosive plays. That's the whole theory behind the defense. Now, to make that work, Jordan Davis has got to eat up blockers and let N'Kobe Dean run to the football. Let the Eagles play one less player in the box so they can stop the run. A, can he do it? And B, and this is the more important question, Ray, Will he ever be regarded as worthy of being the 13th overall pick if he just does his job and he's Vita Bea or Haloti Nada and he's not getting sacks? He's just making things easier for others. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. I, I, yeah, I don't think that's an issue, John, in terms, in terms of justifying where he was picked in the draft. If he comes in and does everything that you just said, which is really what you drafted him to be, um, then, yeah, then exactly right. Then he is one very big piece of a puzzle that is complete and ultimately will win you a championship. Then everybody justifies everything at that point. Everybody everybody has done their job well enough to get you where you want to go. You know, I I never – you know, when people said that they were disappointed in Davis last year, um, I, I think they kind of just misunderstood the kind of player that he is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's, he's, I mean, he's not Alan Page, and he, he's, he's never going to be. He's not John Randall. I mean, that's not what he is. I mean, he is just a big, powerful guy who can control the line of scrimmage and, and, and shut the valve on the running game. That's really what he is. And you put him next to a, a defensive tackle – who is more of a guy that's explosive in the gap and can get up the field. And that's exactly what you're looking for. And that's what they're going to hope that they get with he and Carter playing side by side. And, you know, Carter is that up the field kind of behind the line of scrimmage guy. Um, but I think Davis can certainly do his job. And I, I actually thought, you know, I've had people say, Oh, he was a disappointment last year. I don't really, I don't really feel that. I mean, I thought, yeah, he got off to a little bit of a slow start, but he was a rookie. He's kind of figuring it out. And then, I thought he started to play well, and then he got hurt. Yeah, and he, was he was playing down. really well before yeah, he got I hurt. He, see, I thought he was playing really good, and then he got yeah. the injury, he got the ankle injury, and he was out for a while. And then when he came back, he never quite got back to where he had been. But I thought once he kind of got a sense of the difference of even SEC football to NFL football, and he began to understand the spacing and the angles and the speed of the game, you saw his natural ability come, and he gained his confidence – and I thought for a stretch there before the ankle injury, I thought he was playing really good football. I was on his way, got hurt, had to come back. But I think he's going to be, I think he's going to be really good. I think Dean's going to be really good. You know, Carter has a chance to be very good. I mean, there are a lot of people that will tell you that he may have been the best player in this entire draft. Uh, that's so, me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was, uh, he's, he was really good, really, really good. And, you know, you know there are questions about him 
in, in other areas, which I kind of understand. But you just put on the tape and you just watch, and there's no question this guy's got outstanding ability. I mean, outstanding ability. I mean, it's rare to see a guy uh, his size that's that explosive out of the stance uh, and that's strong with his hands and uh, and smart. I mean, he's already he's already got some. He's already knows how to use his hands and he already understands principles of leverage. I mean, he was he was. I mean, to me, when I watched him play last year, he looked like an NFL player playing in college. I mean, he looked like an NFL player last year. So there's no reason to think he's going to be anything less than that in Philadelphia. Ray Diddy, there aren't that many questions coming into the season for the Philadelphia Eagles. They're in a very good spot off the season that they had last year. And there was roster turnover, certainly on the defense, uh, but the offense stayed pretty much intact. They did lose, for me, one key piece, though. So that's a question coming into the season. Will the person who starts game one at right guard for the Philadelphia Eagles, assuming health, be the starter all 17 regular season games? Good question, and I and, and I don't think it's been asked often enough. I mean, I um, yeah, the right guard position. I mean, Sam Malo was a pretty good player. He was. I mean, he didn't get. Yeah. You know, he. I mean, he was. He's. I mean, he's in, very overshadowed because he's playing next to an all-time great player in Kelsey. He's playing between two great players in Kelsey yep. and Johnson. You know, and then you got Mylotta, who's this great story at left tackle, uh, and so everybody just kind of took Sam Malo for granted, which they shouldn't have done. I mean, he was. I mean, he wasn't at that level, but he was he was a good, consistent player who didn't make mistakes. Uh, and it was he was a really good fit in that spot. Uh, losing him is not a small loss, in my view. So he has to be replaced. I have I, I, I haven't talked to you guys about this. I, I have never you know, the, the convent you call conventional wisdom was oh, we'll just move Jurgens over there. You know, Jer well, Jer Jurgens will just play there. My reaction was, oh, yeah. Oh yeah, it's that easy, huh? You yeah. know, oh, yeah, we're just going to take this uh, this center, and we're just going to put him at right guard, and that's that. You know, it'll be fine. Come on, uh, Ray. All, all all I have to do is have Stoutland wave his magic wand, and it's done. Yeah, yeah. You, you, did you miss that memo? Whatever Stoutland touches turns to gold. Uh, yeah, I, I I don't see it that way. Um, <laughs> I don't, uh, frankly, I don't think I don't think he's big enough. I don't. Think yeah. Well, that's you know that if you think about it, Ray. You know, for many years, it was Brandon Brooks next to Jason Kelsey. And Isaac's a, a, a pretty big player. It's not Brandon's size, but pretty big player himself. And the kind of thought process behind that was, well, you got to protect. Uh, as good as Kelsey is, there are some weaknesses. And one of yeah. the weaknesses is he's very undersized. Yep. And now you have undersized, undersized instead of the big, powerful Brandon Brooks or Isaac Sayamalo. I'm totally, with you. John, totally different players. Totally yeah. different players. And that's why, you know, I kept reading these stories and people say, oh, well, Cam Jurgens, I'm just going to put him over there. And I'm saying, oh, yeah? It's, it's that simple, huh? Uh, I it, it, Listen, if they're – and I, I have all the respect in the world for Jeff Stoutland. He's as good an offensive line coach as I've ever seen. Um, and so I've seen him make ordinary players into better players. But – um you got to have you got to have the frame to start with, and to me, if you put if that's your idea, you're going to put Jurgens in there. You're going to be playing with two centers in the middle of your offensive line. I don't think you can do that. Um, yeah. I think that's why they drafted Tyler Steen. Now everybody talks about you know he's you know he's the third day pick. You're not a whole lot of expectation. Um, I think internally they're they're looking at him with the idea that he's going to get a real shot to win that job because he does have the frame to protect. Yeah. Kelsey on that side and you need that you need you need that other guy because you're right I mean Kelsey is is a great player absolutely a great player uh but he has certain limitations and he needs protection on either side of him to do the things that he does so well uh, I don't think Jurgens I don't think Jurgens offers that uh yeah. Steen Steen may be Steen may be I mean he's he's big enough and he's strong enough uh, and he's got the power. He's not going to be Brooks. I mean, Brooks to me was no. a really, really good player. I mean, yeah, even Sam Malo wasn't as good as Brooks, but he was, no. big, but he was big enough and he was smart enough and physical enough that he could do the things that you needed your right guard to do. I don't think, I think Jurgens will be a fine center at some point, but just saying, ah, he's going to play right guard. I don't see it. I, I'd be willing to bet you guys right now that when they start the season, Steen's going to be your right guard. Mm. Yeah. Well, and, you know, to your point, Ray, that's the plan. 
that's the long term plan is for Cam Jurgens to be the center when Jason finally decides to retire and Tyler Steen to be the right guard. That's the long term plan. So if you can get uh, you can get to Tyler Steen as quickly as possible at right guard, why won't you do that? But to your point about Stout, look, he's great. He's the best offensive line coach in the NFL. Let's use Isaac as an example. Very good player. It took a while. You, you, you got to develop. And Isaac was a third-round pick, just like Tyler Steen. It took him a while to develop into the player he was. And I think that's going to be the case with Tyler Steen. So I'm with you there. I, I One last one for me. By the way, about, by, by, yeah, by the way just, just as, as an aside here, while we're talking about the right guard position, I, I would not be so quick to dismiss Jack Driscoll either. Um, yeah. You know, I think that I've seen Driscoll play well enough now that um, I think if he's given a fair opportunity to win that job, he could be competitive there too. I would sooner have him play in right guard than I would Jurgens because I've seen um, yeah. the one problem that Driscoll had when he came up was I thought he just needed to get bigger and stronger, which he has done. I mean, if you saw him last year, I mean, he's significantly bigger than he was before. So, you know, I think he could be more of a physical match for the right guard position than Jurgens. Uh, so, I mean, we're having even, most people aren't even talking about Driscoll. No. Just well, see, you know why I brought up Driscoll? He's kind of your, he's kind of your utility yeah. backup guy. But, you know, I think given the opportunity, wouldn't shock me if he could win that job. I agree with you. I, You know, week one, if you ask me who's likely to be the best player, just the best player of those three, it's probably going to be Jack Driscoll because he's mm -hmm. the most ready. But then you impact, as you mentioned, Ray, the utility guy. He's the sixth man. He's got to be the swing tackle. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have Andre Dillard, so he's got to he's got to back up right tackle and left tackle. And you know who knows? He might be the backup, the top backup at every position, but center. Um, if you put him in the starting lineup, then you start talking about moving parts. Stoutland hates that. You know, no. you got to move guys in game. Uh, move them more than one position. So that's my concern with Jack Driscoll, but I agree with you. I, you know, he's probably the most ready to play right guard and he did it and he did it pretty successfully. Yeah. yeah I think it's, I, yeah, I think he's pretty good. I, I, yeah. I think he's pretty, I think he's pretty good. And, you know, nobody's even mentioning him. They just kind of in their mind, he's just kind of, he's kind of the swing guy. He's the backup guy. I think he, I think he's better than that. And if need be, I think he's a guy that could step in there and play that position and uh, and play it pretty good. Yeah, yeah. His flexibility is his own worst enemy. I think that's going to end up costing him the fact that yeah. he is uh, the backup, the number one backup at several different offensive line positions. All right, Ray, last one for me. We're projecting, we're predicting. That's what you do here in the mem as members of the media. When we get to, let's say, late January, uh, as an NFC championship game, if the Eagles are in it, hopefully hosting it, Who's going to be the opponent? Who's the number one challenger to the Eagles if they're the favorite? And they are, at least in the wagering markets and in a lot of people's minds, the favorite to go back to the Super Bowl again. Who's their biggest competition in the NFC? I would probably say um, the best, the, the next best team is, is still San Francisco. But, I mean, who's their quarterback? You know, I, that I don't know, but they're, they're very good. They're very good across both lines. Uh, their defense, they're good. They're really good. Um, if you were to ask me right now, I would, I would probably say San Francisco. Um, I don't know who they're, I couldn't tell you who their quarterback is going to be, but the rest of that team is, is really good. All right, so let, let, let me push on this one. Assuming health, which is a big ass assumption at this point, how good is Brock Purdy going to be this year? Is something we talk about a lot on this particular show because I happen to be a very big fan and thought he wasn't given enough credit for what he did last year. And then San Francisco throws fuel on the fire and says, oh, if Purdy were here, we would have won the game. No, he could have won the game. Don't give me, we would have won the game. I'm a Purdy guy. Do you think he's got a chance to be a top flight NFL quarterback? Um, top flight meaning how do you define that? Top five, NFC. Top 10, or, well, not because the AFC is so stockpiled, top yeah. five in the NFC isn't yeah. that big a deal. Uh, top 10 quarterback in the NFL overall. 
I don't think it's um, I don't think it's uh, top 10 is probably stretching it, but I'll say, but I'll say this. Um, I liked him too, coming out of college. Uh, the only, the only thing, you, the only knock on him really was his arm strength. Uh, but he's, uh, but he's very, he's a very smart guy and he's extremely accurate. And that was one of the reasons why I thought he got way underdrafted. Uh, I mean, everybody makes a big deal out of, you know, the, being the last pick in the draft, which he was. Right. Uh, but uh -huh. I mean, I, I, I really, I really do feel that, you know, sometimes the, the talent evaluators and the scouts in the NFL just, just, they still, as much as they say, they don't overrate things, they do overrate things. And to me, arm strength in the NFL, it's nice to have, it's great to have, you know, I'll, I'll take a strong arm quarterback for sure. But, yeah. you know, yeah, I mean, you don't, you know, have, you don't win games in the NFL week in and week out by throwing seventy-yard passes. You no, know, you, you you might throw two a year. Aaron Rodgers might throw two a year. Who, yeah. who cares? Can he make yeah. NFL throws? You That's, win. You yeah. you win. You win with accuracy, and, and yeah. you, you win. You win with accuracy. You win with timing. You win with judgment. Uh, and guys that have that, they can win if you put the right people around them. And and Purdy is is that kind of guy. I think he's look. I think he's in the perfect situation. You know, you put him on a bad team, then it's just going to expose the things he can't do. Right. But you put him, you put him on a really good team where he mm -hmm. is, uh, and and just let him play his game, and he can win for you, which he demonstrated last year. Yeah, I mean, I I I, I think that he can be the guy for that team, and that's why I said right now, if you were to ask me who's going to be their opponent in the championship game, I think it's very likely to be a rematch. I think it's yeah. likely to be the Niners. Yeah. So as as do I. Ray Diddy, it is a pleasure to have you on. Now that we know that you're good to get set up and put the Emmys behind you and be able to hop in with us. Yeah. Oh, we'll, we'll, since you're yeah. so retired, wrong, uh, from both radio and television and writing, you got downtime. You can hop on with Mac and Mac here on Birds 360. And it's beat season. One more time. One last read out in paper, dip, paperback, new, new afterward. By Ray Digin Didinger. Yeah, they, they asked me to write uh, like a final chapter add to the yeah. book about last year, about my decision to, as Jody laughingly refers to it, <laughs> uh, and then all, all the things that happened in Philadelphia last year with the World Series and the Super Bowl. It felt like, you know, we really kind of have to address that, don't we? So I wrote a final chapter that kind of covers that ground. Well, nice. Hopefully, hopefully they ask you to do another final chapter again next year after the Phillies and the Eagles have another successful postseason run in both of them. I Ray Diddy, so. always a pleasure, brother. Thank you very much for doing this. We will be in touch. All right. You know where to find me. That is have a great, great day, guys. Bye-bye. All-time great Ray <laughs> Diddy here with us on uh, Birds 365. And I love what he said about Purdy. The question was his arm trick. Johnny Mac, you know this, I know this. I get more of a hands-on Eagles feel, and we're just talking about fans, not scouts and other teams. You know whose arm strength was questioned? After he replaced Carson Wentz as the starting quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles, yeah. that would be Jalen Hurts. Well, oh, he doesn't have a strong enough arm. Carson Wentz has a stronger arm than Jalen Hurts. We're going to go backwards with Carson. Oh, yeah. You know how many of those calls I feel to Johnny Mac? That uh, why we wasted a second round pick. He doesn't have the arm strength to play in the NFL. You can improve your arm strength. You can put effort in. You can get better at it. Jalen Hurts did it. Would not be surprised if Brock Purdy did it as well. Yeah, I mean, I I talked to Nick Sirianni a lot about arm strength, and you know, it's similar to what I said. I was talking about receivers. You have to have a certain baseline. Once you hit that baseline, you're good to go. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It, it, like Ray said, look, it's nice when you have to throw a Hail Mary and you have Aaron Rodgers and you can get it there from 70 yards away in his prime. It's nice. But remember, you don't want to be in that position. So that, you never want to be in that position. It, it doesn't come up enough to worry about the key two aspects are decision-making and accuracy. Yep. And, and those are the two, and, and Nick judges for, the, the third one would be, you know, movement skills to be able to do stuff off schedule. Obviously, Jalen's tremendous at that. And then the fourth is arm strength. And all you got to hit is the baseline. He hits the baseline. He can make every NFL throw. Um, yeah, 
it's so overrated. One once you hit it, it's like when we're talking about receivers. It, it, do you have to run a four two nine to be a receiver in this league? I got to cover Chris Carter for years. He's in the Hall of Fame. Um, he hit the baseline, and he did everything else spectacularly. Um, yeah, people don't get it. No, they they put too much of an emphasis on. And the thing that annoyed me about Jalen Hurts was people said he didn't have the arm strength and he wasn't accuracy accurate enough. Because you go back and you check the numbers, his percentage completion the year he filled in with Carson Wentz wasn't good. Oh, then he's going to be that type of quarterback for the rest of his life. Because in four games replacing Carson Wentz, that was his. Uh, forget the fact that Eagles offensive line was injured. Forget the fact that their wide receiver core was uh, certainly uh, able to be upgraded. Oh, no, that's going to be his completion percentage for the rest of his career. Of course, there's chance for improvement. And we saw it with Jalen Hurts to his almost MVP season this past year. All right, McMullen and McDonald, we are Mac and Mac here on Bird Street 65. Quickie timeout. We got another good guest coming up in hour number two. Stay right there. 